is more important to know which patient the disease has than which disease the patient has. So said Hippocrates. And so say proponents of what I call me medicine, otherwise known as personalized medicine. They're effectively asserting in me we trust, to riff on the American motto, in God we trust. Now, you might think that all medicine is already personalized, and there's something in that. When I've spoken on this topic to audiences of general practitioners, family doctors, they tend to nod sagaciously at this point. Good practice has always relied on close observation of the particular patient. But modern day personalized medicine goes further than that. It claims to be a revolution overturning what it calls the traditional one-size-fits-all model of medicine. How could it do that? Building on developments in genomic and genetic science, personalized medicine aims to find genetic linkages to certain diseases. Now, that is a very broad definition, so let me be a little more specific. For example, pharmacogenetics which is probably the most advanced arm of personalized medicine, aims to tailor particular drug treatments to the genetic profile of a particular patient or the genetic profile of a particular cancer. And in so doing, the hope is that it might be able to more efficiently identify how well the patient is going to metabolize that particular treatment and spare people who are particularly sensitive to side effects. Here's a personal example. After a quadruple heart bypass, my uncle spent many years trying to get his dosage of a blood thinner called warfarin adjusted to his particular needs. And he was in discomfort and distress a lot of that time. Now, maybe a genetic test for warfare intolerance could have spared him that, and such tests are now sometimes available. You may also have heard of another kind of test, direct-to-consumer genetic testing, in which you can pay to have a cheek swab or a spit sample analyzed for your propensity to some, not all, diseases. And of course, bear in mind that not all disease is rooted in genetics. So the claim behind direct-to-consumer genetic testing is that this will enable you to take control of your health future. So are we and our doctors right to trust in me medicine? Not blindly. In the rest of this talk, I want to show why I think in me we trust is a problematic attitude. Now you might wonder why. What could be wrong with personalized medicine? It sounds good. Are there only rights to it and not wrongs? I think it's not that simple. After an early rush of almost messianic fervor, when even former President Obama said, in no area of medical research is the promise greater than in personalized medicine, Proponents are now actually starting to rein back a bit on their claims. They're not even calling what they do personalized medicine so much anymore. They're using the phrases precision medicine or stratified medicine. Well, precision sounds good, although we might hope that all medicine would be as precise as possible. But stratified is a lot less attractive than personalized. Why would anyone want to use that term? Here's the reason. Many clinicians acknowledge that their best hope lies in using genomic science to sort patients into similar genetic profile groups, not as individuals, but as strata, as groups. Genomic medicine can almost never deliver an absolutely personalized diagnosis, except perhaps in some cases of rare diseases. 
Besides, no drug company could afford to produce a treatment for me and me alone, unless possibly I'm Bill Gates. The cost would be prohibitive. The more narrow the niche market for the drug, the higher the price is likely to be. And we are seeing some personalized medicines coming in at quite high prices. So the more stratified the medicine, the more stratospheric the price might be. And in a national health service such as ours, that is a serious consideration. Like the National Health Service, the Human Genome Project was motivated by communitarian ideals. The Human Genome Project laid the foundations for personalized medicine by sequencing the entire genome of all of humanity. And we can think of sequencing a genome as being a bit like laying out a blueprint or a code for how to build a human being. Now, the Human Genome Project used communitarian language, what I call the language of we medicine, as opposed to me medicine. For example, it referred to the human genome as the common heritage of humanity. Now, that isn't just abstract idealism. It was we medicine, which I am now also going to define in terms of traditional public health measures, such as screening, sanitation, vaccination. Those traditional public health measures gave us the big increases in lifespan that we enjoyed in the 20th century. And it's not just for ancient history. Modern day cancer statistics are improving, but they are improving not so much yet because of personalized medicine, because of me medicine, but because of traditional we medicine, public health measures, such as smoking reduction campaigns or cancer screening. At this point, you may say, what about Angelina Jolie? And you'd be right. You may remember that she helped to publicize screening for two genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, where the adverse form of the gene is linked to early onset breast and ovarian cancer. Now, what's interesting here is that this was an example of building bridges between we and me medicine. The public health campaign was traditionally, you know, that's we medicine. But the knowledge on which it rested, which was knowledge from genetics and genomics, the same knowledge that underpinned the Human Genome Project, that is all associated with personalized medicine and me medicine. So I think we can build these bridges, but to the extent that we spend more on me medicine, there will probably be less to spend on we medicine. And that, I think, would be quite a shame. But it's not all about money. There are also very serious ethical and policy issues that we need to think about before we decide whether to trust altogether in me medicine. For example, should all newborn babies be genetically sequenced so that we know which variant of each gene the child has? And the idea here is that in some way that might protect the child, that knowledge. Now, the science here is in its infancy. Uh, please don't groan at the pun. Well, you can if you like. Uh, but while the science is still developing, the cost is not exorbitant. So the real issues are ethical. And the debate boils down into two camps. On the one side, we would have traditional utilitarians who would argue that we could do public welfare a lot of good by sequencing all children at birth. And on the other side, we might have traditional rights theorists who would argue that particularly if that was compulsory, that it would 
impose restrictions on the child's and parents' rights to an open future. Would you want to have your own child sequenced? Would you want to have been sequenced yourself? I don't think I would for myself because I would be worried about the problem of false positives. I would not want to live the rest of my life in fear of a disease which I have been wrongly predicted to contract. But as a parent, I might feel more torn. It seems like a responsible thing to do. But on the other hand, it could lead to anxious parenting. Except in cases of childhood onset genetically linked diseases, it might be better to let our children make up their own minds when they reach adulthood about whether they wish to be genetically sequenced and not for us to lumber them with knowledge they would not have wanted. Talking about personal choice brings me on to what I regard as a very important factor explaining popular interest in me medicine. Quite often, direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies and ardent advocates of personalized medicine lay a lot of stress on choice. Now, choice, individualism, autonomy, these are almost sacred values in our civilization. I'm all for autonomy and choice. As a medical school teacher, I've tried to promote a less paternalistic, less doctor knows best style of doing medicine for my students. As a patient, I have certainly experienced situations when I was not given a genuinely informed choice or when my informed choice was not respected. But are choice and autonomy the only values that we want to promote in medicine? I don't think so. To my mind, these me medicine, individualistic values are important, but they need to be counterbalanced and bridges need to be built to the we medicine values of justice, solidarity, and compassion. We shouldn't lose sight of those we medicine values in the flurry of excitement around me medicine. We should build bridges. Now, that may sound like pie in the sky, but it is practical and possible. I want to close with an illustration. You remember the two genes in the Angelina Jolie example, BRCA1 and BRCA2. A US firm took out a range of patents on those two genes and on diagnostic test kits associated with them. And this is on the genes themselves, not just on the test kits which makes it impossible for a competitor to invent around. Now, because they almost held a monopoly, the firm was able to charge fees of between three to four thousand dollars for a genetic test kit. And I should stress that the firm was by no means alone in patenting genes. As of 2005, something like one in five human genes was the subject of a patent. So one patient who thought she might be at risk because of her family history of breast and ovarian cancer, Elizabeth Chariani, couldn't obtain the test because the firm would not accept her insurance and she couldn't afford to pay privately. So together with a number of other such patients, a number of American medical bodies, professional medical bodies, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the Southern Baptist Convention. She took out a court action seeking to overturn those patents. Now what's interesting here is that the patents were rooted in me medicine. That is, they were rooted in the developments that have made personalized medicine possible genomic science. But this rainbow coalition, to my mind, represented we medicine in action. 
what happened. It took four years, but the Rainbow Coalition won. The US Supreme Court held that in their natural state, patents and the information they encode are not eligible for patents for, sorry, patents, genes on genes, and the information the genes encode are not eligible for patents. Instead, they belong to all of us as the common heritage of humanity. Thank you.